Network News is next. Then meet extraordinary dogs that change lives. After 60 Minutes, Reputations traces Muhammad Ali's rise beyond boxing to iconic fame. Good evening, New Zealand, leading tonight's One Network News. Celebrations for the Alliance as the United States deals a body blow to a global agreement on investment. Te Papa has hailed a huge success as thousands stretch the museum's resources. And the Kiwi cricketers favour a rare double over their Aussie rivals. Government trade officials are scrambling tonight to confirm reports that the United States is pulling out of a controversial agreement on global investment. The government supports the Multilateral Agreement on Investment, or MAI, saying it will promote growth and jobs. But the alliance, which strongly opposes MAI, is claiming victory. Penny Deans reports. The Alliance are celebrating what looks like the end of the MAI, an agreement that would remove restrictions on international investors around the world, clearing the way, for example, for foreigners to buy our ports. Well done, everybody. Yeah, well well done. Done. The Alliance has been campaigning against the MAI, saying New Zealand should be able to block investment that's not in our best interests. Today, Reuters news agency is quoting American officials in Washington as saying they won't sign because the agreement's not broad enough. It's not to say at the end of the day that the MAI is completely sunk, but I'd say that it's been holed, uh, a bit like the Titanic really, um, almost certainly terminally. New Zealand trade officials arrive in Paris about now for MAI negotiations. The government believes the agreement will bring more jobs and economic growth by making it easier for foreign-owned companies like Camalco to invest here. Officials are tonight trying to confirm the U.S. position. Trade Minister Lockwood Smith says reports it won't sign are disappointing. And if they're right, the whole agreement may well be scuttled. Penny Deans, One Network News. One climber has died and another is in hospital after falling several metres into a crevasse in Mount Cook National Park. The accident happened as a group of climbers were heading over Copeland Pass. Police say the man who died had gone to look for the other climber and fell into the crevasse himself. The pair were airlifted to Timaru Hospital. Three New Zealand backpackers and an Australian have left South Africa after falsely claiming they were mugged at knife point. Johannesburg police say that in the wake of the mugging of two Pakistani cricketers in the city, the women's claims were widely reported. They claimed they'd each lost about $2,000, but police say their claim was part of an insurance scam. The parents of one of the women have told One Network News that fraud and perjury charges against the women had been dropped. Organisers are hailing the opening of New Zealand's newest museum as a huge success. Over 35,000 visitors went through Te Papa on opening day. And Phil O'Sullivan reports the crowds are still coming. Te Papa greeted by queues right round the block this morning. The opening day party finishing at midnight with straw bales sent to drought-stricken farmers. We didn't have a single unpleasant incident at all. It was just marvellous, just, just quite wonderful. As the clean-up went on, Wellington Zoo animals benefited from what was left over. Inside, the interactive rides are popular, but the exhibitions are holding people's interest. Well, we had people here six hours and more, so I think that took us a bit by surprise. They were a hungry lot. Around half had something to eat or drink in the cafes or restaurant. Bakers and food suppliers had to work through the night after much of today's food was eaten yesterday. All washed down with around 9,000 cups of Te Papa blend coffee. It does have to pay its way, and, it, and if the first, first day is anything, in, in, an indication to go by, then we're going to do very, very well. Te Papa's now open from 10 till 6 every day of the year. Phil O'Sullivan, One Network News. Te Papa is Wellington's newest building, and it's also one of the safest. An engineer who helped design the museum has told a conference how it's been built not only to survive earthquakes, but threats from the sea as well. You at Barnsley with the story. Wellington Harbour, one of the world's most beautiful, potentially one of the most dangerous. It's defenceless against tsunami, tide-like waves triggered by earthquakes powerful enough to destroy the business centre. And the problem is not just the, uh, the danger to people who are in underground shopping centres and so on, 
Uh, there's also the threat to the telecommunications and electric services and all the services, in fact. If they're taken out, it'll take months to restore them. At an engineers conference in Auckland, Dr Barnett explained how he helped protect Te Papa against tsunami. The museum's built on a mound almost two metres above street level, and none of our priceless history is exhibited on the ground floor. Every few hundred years there are going to be major tsunamis, and we have to be ready for them. Last century, he says, more New Zealanders died from tsunami than earthquakes. An entire Maori village drowned in the Chathams. Tsunami is sneaky shockwaves that travel like a submarine under the ocean. It's only when they reach land that they become waves and a problem. Te Papa may be safe enough, but Dr Barnett says a flood bank's needed to protect central Wellington from a small tsunami and a big risk. You at Barnsley, One Network News. A warning tonight about the need for caution when answering the door to charity collectors. It follows the arrest of a group of young sweet sellers in Hamilton yesterday. One is facing burglary charges. Five others will be dealt with by youth aid. Kay Hawksby reports. Police say it was in this Hamilton suburb that a group aged between 8 and 17 arrived from South Auckland to sell fundraising suites. But tomorrow, a 17-year-old appears in court on three charges of burglary. Five juveniles will be dealt with by youth aid. These children were seen in and around the scenes of the burglaries and inquiries were carried out and they were located later in the afternoon. The incidents upset a charity watchdog group. Whenever there's any kind of um, problem, scandal, anything like this that affects fundraising, then all charities suffer. The IHC National Appeal's due to start tomorrow, and organisers say collectors will be clearly labelled with identification badges. Hi, I'm collecting for the IHC Appeal. In terms of collectors, they should look to see that they can see both the card and the bag, which will identify the person as an official IHC collector. Jan Dowland Hello, also says Bye. if you don't want to donate at the door, you can mail it in. The Accountability for Charities group is working to set up a code of practices for collectors. Meanwhile, police say people should ask for identification and feel free to shut the door while they're getting their donation. Kate Hawksby, One Network News. Another setback for the United States as it seeks support from military strike against Iraq. China has joined fellow UN Security Council members Russia and France in opposing the use of force. American envoy Bill Richardson couldn't sway the Chinese who say military action would just hurt innocent Iraqis. Meanwhile, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan says he's prepared to go to Baghdad in a last-ditch effort to break the impasse over UN weapons inspections. New Zealand's contribution to any US-led military action will be decided at tomorrow's cabinet meeting. About 100 people have been killed after two trains collided and set off a huge explosion in Cameroon. The explosion or the collision happened on the outskirts of the capital Yaoundé. One of the trains was hauling oil tankers which ruptured. Eyewitnesses say people were trying to scoop up the oil when it caught fire and exploded. From California, a miracle survival story. A 14-year-old snowboarder has been found alive after six days lost in freezing conditions. Jeff Thornton was airlifted from rugged terrain about three kilometres from where he went missing. He'd endured freezing temperatures and snow I expected snow to find a body. I didn't, never expected to find him alive. Rescuers say that apart from dehydration and some frostbite, the boy was otherwise uninjured. Here at home, thousands of people lined the shores of Otago Harbour this afternoon to welcome a Russian sailing ship. The training vessel Nadezda is here as part of Otago's 150th anniversary celebrations. John McDermott reports. Built in the 1990s, but styled on the grandeur and elegance of the past. The big training ship arriving from Hobart is home to 100 young Russian cadets and a crew of 60. Among the flotilla greeting her, the Otago University research vessel, Munida. The tall ship certainly gives off a, a great sense of uh, romance and uh, how things were. The sea is Skipper Chris Spears' life. And not content with just looking at tall ships, he's building one. A one-tenth scale model of the John Wycliffe, the first ship to bring settlers to Otago 150 years ago next month. They were pretty hardy people, and I guess what that makes us uh, New Zealanders unique because of the, uh, the kind of people that they were and the visions that they had. The model will become a centrepiece for the celebrations, 
But meanwhile, all the attention's on her bigger cousin. The Nadista's welcoming visitors during her five-day Dunedin stay. John McDermott, One Network News. Great sight. Later in the program, a new tourist treat, but only for those with green fingers. The first Mike has sport. Yes, thanks, Tom. The Black Caps celebrate rare success. Plus, Frank Nobolo is on a birdie streak in the final round of the Australian Masters. And Dylan Meeker puts in a Zimzan-like performance as the Blues bounce back against Queensland. Great option. What a bounce. What a time. Tonight on 60 Minutes. People choose whether they're going to be a heterosexual or a homosexual. It's a choice, though. The controversial night of gay abandon. If Liz Mills and David Hay and Phil Raffles and the rest of those morons don't like it, tough. The man with a vision to bridge time, barriers and boundaries. Let's be all united by the turn of the next century. All New Zealanders. And the parents who let their children die. Sickness is caused by the devil. Only God has the power to heal. 60 Minutes, 7.30 tonight on One. We're running out the Nissan Maxima. Yes, New Zealand's best-selling Japanese V6 for the last five years is now at a special run-out price from 33995 Drive Away. What do you think? No. You're right. It's got a great view. Well, we could always sell the car. You'll love this one. It's got it. It may take a little bit of luck to find the right home, but when it comes to finding the right home loan... You're so lucky. You'll see that luck has nothing to do with it at the National Bank. Thoroughbred Home Loans. From the National Bank. Telecom, we've permanently tumbled the price of calling all your favourite countries. For example, our economy rates to the UK and Ireland have just tumbled from $1.69 a minute to just 67 cents a minute. Every night from 6pm and all weekend. From now on, with Telecom. It's nice to know that for those precious 18 months while Lisa's growing up, 18 months free credit on furnishings could be yours. From Mackenzie and Willis. Designed with you in mind. Your dream home, as individual as you. Built by people who care. Signature homes offer flexibility with interior and exterior options. Design options that meet your needs. It could only be a signature home. Phone now for your free information pack. 0800 Signature. That's 0800 744 628. Signature Homes. As individual as you. A $5,000 windfall could be yours when you shop with the latest New World coupon book. There's also over $200 in savings on popular everyday grocery lines. The New World coupon book. It's as good as cash in the hand. Hello, Kevin Dore, Dominion Carpets. We have slashed 10 to 50% off our entire range of carpets, with prices as low as $30 a metre. Dominion Carpets, we're under the Big Sheep in Cass Street, first right over the Colombo Overbridge. Good evening. New Zealand cricket is celebrating just its third ever back-to-back one-day victories against Australia. Stephen Stewart has the aftermath to last night's 30-run triumph. Victory scenes reminiscent of the last time New Zealand beat Australia at Eden Park in the Cricket World Cup six years ago. Consistency has always been the problem for New Zealand and the only other time they've recorded consecutive wins against Australia were in the 1985-86 and 92-93 seasons. 
still coming to terms with his surprise role in proceedings, is 36-year-old Canterbury spinner Mark Priest, rushed into the side to replace an injured Daniel Vittori. Well, I'd woken up and um, I thought someone was joking me. So uh, I didn't believe that it was really Ross Sykes on the end of the phone. His Canterbury teammate Chris Harris was named man of the match. Timely as he's won a place in the New Zealand 12 for the first test against Zimbabwe starting next Thursday. While some of the Australians were gracious in Valentine's Day defeat, there was no love lost between their hamstrung captain Steve Waugh and New Zealand all-rounder Dion Nash. Waugh is adamant Nash took a step back into his path as he was dashing between wickets. I'm not going to say either way, but you know, the footage is there for you guys to see and you can make up your own mind. The match referee cautioned Nash to be careful in future that he stays out of the way of running batsmen. Replays suggested the collision was accidental, and rather than dwell on that, Nash can look forward to a test recall based on his one-day form. Stephen Stewart, One Network News. There's an undisputed villain in the third West Indies England cricket test, the Queen's Park Oval pitch. England's innings was in tatters when Nasser Hussain went for a duck. Replays showed he had cause for displeasure. Alex Stewart produced the best batting of the match, reaching 44 on the bowler's paradise, only to fall to Carl Hooper's gentle offspin. And Kirtley Ambrose returned to knock over the tail, England all out for 145. Brian Lara was looking ominous by stumps on the second day. The West Indies hold an overall lead of 85 runs with eight wickets in hand. Earlier, Kirtley Ambrose claimed yet another five-wicket bag on the helpful Queen's Park Oval pitch. Frank Nobolo is charging up the leaderboard in the final round of the Australian Golf Masters in Melbourne. Nobolo started the day 11 under, tied for sixth. This eagle putt to go 15 under. By the 12th hole, his birdie blitz was in full swing. Tied for fourth. He got it. And on the 13th, there was action replay as Nobolo moved to outright fourth place. Oh, he's done it again. He got a birdie at 12, now a birdie at 13. Nobolo also birdied 16 on his way to a six under par round of 67 and fourth at this stage, but there was no catching the overnight leader, Brad Hughes. The men's figure skaters held centre stage at the Winter Olympics today. It was a three-way battle, as sports editor Peter Williams reports. From Russia with love, 20-year-old Muscovite Ilya Kulik with a virtuoso performance to Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. Triple Axel. <laughs> Beautiful. What an Kulik, the first skater in 50 years to win gold at his first Olympics, but Frenchman Philippe Candeloro was the show stealer. Inspired by the this musketeer d'Artagnan, he sparkled his way to a bronze medal. What's the price of admission? Sympathy, though, for the world champion Elvis Stoiko of Canada, suffering from the flu and a groin injury. His free skate was of a high technical quality, but lacking in real emotion. Elvis has been very much alive here tonight, but figure skating has a new king, Ilya Kulik, giving Russia its second gold medal from two finals here at the White Ring. Canadian fans had more to shout about at the hockey. Three second period goals, enough for a one goal win over defending champion Sweden. And the third time, there was no fake. And here's the third time right here, Silver Fern down the spiral again last night. Alan Henderson piloting the New Zealand Bob with Angus Ross in the back seat. After two of four runs, they're 29th of 39, below what they'd hoped. The first run we tapped going into corner one, which is a critical place, a brilliant place to slow off speed if that's what you're aiming to do. Um, and again, on the second run, a tap between one and two, which is the same thing. But New Zealand's best medal hope is in town now. Claudia Riegler and coach Sepp Wiesenbach are arriving yesterday not too worried about her poor World Cup season. Well, as you have seen in the, in the results so far, uh, I can be pretty confident in the Olympics because nothing has been the way everybody else expected it to be. Riegler's slalom race is on Thursday. Peter Williams, One Network News, Nagano. The Auckland Blues have shaken off their pre-season blues with a win over Queensland last night. Players to drive on it. The Blues form reversal started up front with a far more committed effort by the pack, giving them an early lead. Great drive by Auckland, there's another try. The against the Crusaders, the Blues had let in four tries, but much tighter defence paid dividends against Queensland. Nobody in front of him. What are the soccer skills like? Well, he didn't need them. John Olomo showed some encouraging form, but it was the Reds' number 11, Damian Smith, who impressed with his finishing. 
It was a case of too much spice for Tim Horan as he was sin bin for an attempted headbutt on the Blues halfback. His nickname is Helmet because it is quite a big head. The Blues will be boosted by their latest performance. Even the loss of Zinzan Brook seemed a little easier to handle after some Zinni-like play by Dylan Mika. Great option. What a bounce. What a try. A perfect try, but the Crusaders had been anything but against New South Wales. Try to perfect. Resting All Blacks Justin Marshall and Andrew Mertens, the Waratahs took full toll of too many Canterbury errors. The win to New South Wales, leaving all four teams in the Southern Cross competition with a win and a loss. Still there. After the Kiwi team cleaned up at the World Life Saving Championships last week, the New Zealand clubs were out to do the same today. Mary Durham was there. Olympian Trent Bray, a key to New Zealand's World Championship win and in brilliant form again today. The new Plymouth old boy and teammate Corey Hutchings led in the early stages of the board rescue, but eventually gave too much ground to South African club Durban. The Kiwis still managed third. This one only 10 minutes earlier, Bray was racing in the Tube Rescue. New Plymouth Old Boys win, the first for a New Zealand club in this event. This is the international I won up there and um, it was feeling really good and most of the people that did it here were there so uh, I just ran out, kicked pretty hard and got a good lead and they just couldn't catch me coming home. They also couldn't catch another New Plymouth old boy, Callum Taylor, who now has club and country world titles in the beach sprint. Last week we got up pretty high for that and uh, most of us have been battling this week just trying to get the head right again for today and stoke with it, you know. Kelly Piper was the big chance in the women's race, the Red Beach runner finishing third behind world champ Colleen Brinskin, while Opanaki and Lyle Bay shared honours in the IRBs. Mary Durham, One Network News. Look like a great day. New Zealand has a chance to wrap up the Davis Cup tennis tie against Lebanon after winning the doubles to take a 2-1 lead. Tom. Mike, thank you very much. Still to come, Karen predicts more humidity and even some rain in the west. And here on a working holiday, tourists who pay to play in the garden. On a bleak Sunday morning in 1995, a four-year-old girl caught sight of something very different. It was a really big dish. Fledgling international airline Freedom Air gave itself a mere four weeks to get off the ground. There it is, up there! They gave their newly chosen telecommunications company just two. With the launch date looming, a temporary microwave radio dish was erected outside the managing director's office, while fiber optic cable was speedily laid to Freedom Air's soon-to-be-completed call center. In just 13 days, they had completed what was deemed by other telecommunications companies an impossibility, which is probably why their peers in the industry have awarded them the most responsive telecommunications organization award four years in a row. Who? If you're looking for a home loan right now, you should be thinking about style, comfort, performance, because if your ASB Bank home loan is advanced by the 17th of April, 1998, you could win a brilliant BMW Z3 Roadster. Choose this excellent fixed rate and it could be you driving away with the most exhilarating home loan on the road. Celebrating 150 years. ASB Bank, your future bank. Servant. Nor their ass. Nor their ox. And at our prices, there's really no need to covet their brand new Mitsubishi Lancer. You can get your own. I noticed Annie was spending more time at my neighbor's house than at home. Since then, I discovered she was being fed Purina One. 
She's never been healthier. Her eyes are brighter, her coat is shinier, and she has more energy. So I started feeding her Purina 1-2. She just loves the taste of the real chicken or real salmon. There's no better nutrition. Try it. You'll notice the difference too. Purina 1. Sick. For the best of both rates, find out about a National Bank Thoroughbred Combined Home Loan. Call us now to find out about our special offer. These hot February nights sure bring a touch of the tropics, don't they? Yes, they do. Mozzies and all, Karen. Oh, yes, Tom. Horrible little blighters. Just <laughs> thinking about them makes me itchy. <laughs> and it looked like another steamy night on the way, so they'll be out biting again. We had a big spread in temperatures over the South Island today from the lowest high of 20 recorded in Dunedin right up to the top temperature of 32, 34 in Hamner Springs. And in between we had 25 in Christchurch, 27 in Kaikoura, a warm 31 in Blenheim. Wellington settled on 25. Over the hill, Masterton was simmering on 30. Is your name? Air New Zealand. It's our business to make you feel at home. Sourced from the Southern Alps, NZ Natural Mineral Water, as pure as it gets. New Plymouth, Napier and Hastings in the North Island reached a high of 33 today, dropping to 22 in the Bay of Islands. In the South Islands, temperatures ranged between the nationwide high of 34 to Hamda Springs, down to a high of 20 degrees for Dunedin. Looking at the satellite picture, a flimsy tongue of cloud over northern New Zealand marks a weak stationary front with clear skies across the middle of the country due to a ridge of high pressure. By midday tomorrow, the large anti-cyclone lingers well east with its ridge over the far north, while the front currently over the north of the North Island slips southwards to lie west of Taranaki. To the upper North Island tomorrow, cloudy periods with isolated showers, Whangarei and Hamilton are both heading for 28. Further south, fine with hot nor'westers in the east, cloudy at times elsewhere, turning to misty rain. The UV index is very high to these places. To the upper South Island, rain in the north and west, but dry with high cloud along the east. Both Blenheim and Christchurch are heading for 27. And for the rest of the country, rain in the west with falls in Southland and Otago, fine further north. Queenstown's the warmest here, heading for 25. Looking ahead to Tuesday, rain to Westland with falls spreading elsewhere, but fine and very warm over the North Island. Rain spreading to most places on Wednesday, but remaining dry in Gisborne and Hawke's Bay and clearing to fine in Westland and Southland. And for Thursday, fine over much of the country, apart from isolated Charles from Taranaki to Wellington, also Westland and Stewart Island. Finally tonight, a tall ship sailed into Otago Harbour this afternoon to help southerners celebrate 150 years of European settlement. The Russian training vessel Nardesta is bigger than a Cook Strait ferry, and when the sails are up, they cover 3,000 square metres. Carrying 90 cadets and a crew of 50, the vessels come straight from the Sydney to Hobart tall ships race. She'll be open to the public before she leaves at the end of the week. And that's three national news, sport and weather for Sunday the 15th of February. John Campbell and Carol Hirschfeld will be here tomorrow at 6 in a new three news presentation. I'm Neil Wacker. Good night.